anyone can use glyphs in this world if they are a witch. It's not something where you're a witch, but you happen to be blind, you happen to be deaf, or you happen to be mute. You don't have to speak a spell. You don't have to wave a wand. You can use glyphs. And I really wanted to make that part of this system of magic, because a lot of the systems of magic I see, despite how cool wand waving looks and a lot of these things, I feel like sometimes they're limiting, because what if you have someone who can't use their hands? You're listening to Magic and Mediums, the podcast where we talk real magic, psychic abilities, paranormal, the occult, spirituality, and more with your host, Anyel Reed, and members of the magical community. What if I told you that to this day, people are being burned, stoned, and ostracized for their pagan beliefs? Would you believe me? With the proliferation of fantasy and witchy entertainment, and even real deal spirituality in the mainstream, it can be hard to believe that it's still dangerous for witches to be out of the broom closet and even a political no-no. Sure, there are no political ramifications for American witches who admitted to hexing President Trump, but American witches face political ramifications all the time from being penalized for taking pagan holidays, not being afforded the same rights to worship as other religions in jail, being unable to legally promote divination and healing services, and literally being put in a psych ward for admitting to their psychic abilities. In this interview, we chat with the creator of the I Am Hexed series, Kirsten Thompson, about the politics surrounding witchcraft and the political ramifications that modern day witches can face. Do you find any political climate conducive to witchcraft? I think, in theory, a democracy is supposed to be good for witchcraft, but I think that every political climate has its pitfalls when it comes to a religion or belief system that's quote-unquote out there. Mm -hmm. It's so crazy that when you said democracy, I was like, oh yeah, that's a thing. So, um, Theoretically speaking, of course. (laughs) Thanks for reminding us about that. Um, I feel as if with the media and just any sort of lobbying influence and manipulation, especially like legally and just with advertising in general, I really don't feel as if there is a popular democracy of thought, if that makes sense. So when you say democracy, I guess I'm just feeling as if I see the popularization of polarization. So when you said democracy, I was like, ah, (laughs) I do feel like now... I think people are so riled up to either really get into their craft or not be in the craft. What do you think about that? Well, I Am Hex came out of being riled up. So I would say that that's definitely the environment that we're in right now. I mean, I remember Mm -hmm. hearing he who must not be named because it'll send me into a rage spiral, uh, <laughs> talking about witch hunts. And I just sat there, you know, for five minutes after I was just ranting, you know, to someone. And I said, you know what? You know who talks about witch hunts? People who'd never be hunted as witches. The rest of this episode will continue after this message. Bring more magic into your life with the Magic and Mediums Oracle, a 44-card deck introducing you to the magic within and the magic just beyond the veil. Get the deck, psychic readings, and more at www.magicandmediums.com. And now, back to the episode. You know what? You know who talks about witch hunts? People who'd never be hunted as witches. Mm -hmm. And that provoked such a response in me. I thought, okay, so we have witches. You know, witches exist in various walks of life. It's like, what if they're in Washington influencing politics in, you know, prescribed ways? Like, what would that look like? And then I just hit the ground running. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in writing I Am Hex. So it was just mm-hmm. a sort of whirlwind in writing that. But yeah, it was definitely not only me practicing you know, my craft, but also me expressing my craft, so to speak, mm-hmm. in this book. Yeah, definitely. That's awesome. I feel like, number one, I am so annoyed <laughs> that Trump uses words like dragon energy, like when he had that whole thing with Kanye oh, and God. witchcraft and witch hunt, because I have Google alerts for both dragon, witchcraft, and witch. And I was like, <laughs> my mailbox just got really political all of a sudden. So I'm a little annoyed by that. <laughs> and I also just really agree. I actually, I think for me, when the whole thing with Trump, like actually becoming president, I didn't have any reaction to it. 
I was just like, oh, okay. And then I live in New York. So I was like, oh, another day. But then I come into New York and it is like a wave. Like you would have thought it was the second 9-11. Like, I'm not kidding. Like, I think people were wearing black. People at my job are like super silent. I was like, what is going on? Like they made me really afraid. Like maybe I missed out on something. So, <laughs> and then a couple of weeks later, I was like, okay, I could see people like, I don't know. I felt as if people had a switch turned on because of him being elected. And I started really seeing, I want to say, I think many witches came out of the broom closet and became like, okay, guys, now is the time to do something because of it. I really relate with what you were saying about like how you said that you were riled up to do this. And I think it's awesome that From out of tragedy, what some people might say, comes, you know, magic and beauty and, of course, art. So can you tell us a little bit more about the art that came up from you being riled up? Uh, Sure. So I Am Hexed is, you know, in the tagline, it's it's a magical political thriller mystery. And it's the story of Charlie Helm, you know, short for Charlotte, who is a junior political staffer in D.C. And so she's just doing her job, basically, and using a little bit of magic here and there to help her boss. And then her boss gets accused of some you know, corruption, and she gets dragged into it. And so there are you know, non-magical and magical authorities after her. And so she becomes basically the most wanted witch in D.C., and she can't figure out why. And so she ends up working with her ex-girlfriend, uh, an ex-boyfriend, and a mutual friend, to try and track down what's going on, you know, what is behind this conspiracy, what prompted it. And there's definitely a bigger world behind I Am Hexed, and I've gotten to get into a little bit of that in the first four issues, but certainly there's plenty more to explore and there's more going on behind the scenes. But I definitely wanted to show a woman who's aware of what's going on and she tries to help, she really becomes aware that she needs to be even more active. And I think that's a realization that a lot of people came to after the election. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the ACLU and other organizations noting that their donations have gone up, you know, so many percent of right afterwards. And I know I donate Mm -hmm. to masses of organizations and I upped every donation I could right after the election. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I think that that's part of the lesson of I Am Hexed is, you know, more people become motivated, but there's a lot in the backgrounds, you know, so there's a lot of struggles going on in the background of I Am Hex. You'll see protests, you'll see young witches tagging things, and you'll see events that are corollaries to things that are going on right now. And it's like, because witches are another marginalized population, and in this world, it's very open about it. There's laws against witches, you know, so things exactly. like that. Exactly. Yeah, so, I mean, that was really fun to delve into. It was also hugely frustrating, you know, to watch what's happening in America at the same time and, Mm -hmm. you know, the book becoming more politically relevant instead of me saying, well, you know, maybe this will calm down in a year. No, it didn't. Mm -hmm. Wow. So when in your life did you know that witches were a minority, that, you know, there were laws kind of against witches? Well, I'm someone who's been reading some could hold a book, basically. And so Mm -hmm. I was reading things that perhaps I shouldn't have been at some point. Mm -hmm. And so reading lots of history books and other things and finding out you know, about the witch trials and other persecution. And so I think a fairly young age. And then, of course, you start watching movies and you realize Mm -hmm. that witches are always the bad guys in most Mm -hmm. movies. And they are nasty, they're ugly, and they need to be, you know, burned at the stake or have their heads cut off. And so it's pretty clear. I remember it being pretty clear from a young age that witches are not somebody that you want down the road from you. Mm -hmm. They're bad people. You know, they're scary people. So, yeah. Wow. Do you feel that the media representation of witches has carried over into people who don't know anything about the occult, like that this media stereotype is something that muggles quote unquote believe? I think that some media representation has improved. I think you've Mm -hmm. got things like Practical Magic, which is simply one of my favorite (laughs) witch movies ever. I mean, I love Hocus Pocus, but you know, the witches are bad and you know, Mm -hmm. hung, of course. And, you know, things like Harry Potter obviously have made, you know, magic far more mainstream. Everybody wants to be, you know, a witch or a wizard. And so it's not a bad word when you say, oh, Mm -hmm. I'm talking about a Harry Potter witch. It's like, oh, that's okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then, you know, seeing Maleficent, you know, recently. And I thought that Mm -hmm. was excellent, you know, using the idea of magic as empowerment and having your power stolen and having that be a very explicit analogy 
you know, mm-hmm. to the kind of things that happen to women and I, mm-hmm. her taking her power back in that movie. So I thought that was wonderful because I think Maleficent is a much maligned character and I was just so happy to see her take on that role in media and for people to respond to it favorably. Mm-hmm. I like how you kind of mentioned uh, what happens when people take their power away. Something about that reminded me of a book I was reading about hoodoo. And I feel that a lot of the magical practices that have been carried on in some cultures are really just because they were minorities and this magic was taken away and had to be hidden. And so it transformed into what we now know as hoodoo or just these unspoken laws and rules. Do you feel that any system that kind of pushes people to be a political minority is a sort of like magical entity kind of representing the dark side or is there more to it than just saying the government just makes laws and they want to protect people and that's why fortune telling is banned is there is there more to what is on the surface well i think that you have to look back into you know certainly the founding of the united states and you know puritanical influences because that's definitely had an effect on the way this country has you know gone uh, Mm -hmm. the course events have taken and there are certainly powerful religious forces in this country again I mean you look at the evangelicals and other religions and you know it's like religion in and of itself is not bad but you have people who become either zealots and they have a narrow interpretation of any religion be it witchcraft or you know Catholicism and they use Mm -hmm. they use those principles badly or you have people who simply have ill intent and they mm-hmm. mask that ill intent behind saying, well, I'm just, you know, I'm very faithful and I want to control mm-hmm. people because it's my faith. It's like, that is not mm-hmm. the way, you know, your apostles or whomever would want you to act. You know, all these things saying Jesus would do this. It's like Jesus did not, it's like Jesus was a rebel. Mm-hmm. He would chase you out of the temple and kick your butt. And, you know, they're saying, you know, saying all these things. And it's like, no, you're not interpreting your own, you know, scriptures correctly. You're trying to twist them to suit your needs. So Mm -hmm. I think that when government is inhabited by people who have ill will, that that can sort of have that kind of effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not them working a spell, but it is a kind of, you know, when you get a group of these people together, it's just sort of a group think, a group. um, Yeah. Yeah, it's just, it becomes kind of a force in that sense. And it's, I mean, it's obviously really scary. You mean, think about a mob, you know, they are under a group, you know, perception. And they may Mm -hmm. be, it may be religion, it may be, you know, some other um, idea. But it's certainly, you could look at that as magical. Yeah, definitely. It's so interesting also when you said how people interpret well, you didn't say this exactly, but how people interpret the Bible and Jesus. And it reminded me of my own experience with the goddess Hecate, I feel is so, it's typical, you can say, to like other people who've had experiences with this goddess. But I feel that like, I don't really resonate with other people who have her as their goddess. And that makes me, and it's almost the same too with my own experiences with Jesus too. Even though my experience with Jesus, I feel is very typical to other people who have had experiences, but I feel as if when it comes to like spiritual figures, uh, Jesus especially, that you can have your own experience with that figure that is real to you. I think the word's like gnosis, but it's so different from someone else. And so like my interpretation can be so real. And I have these like spiritual experiences to back my understanding of it up. And you yourself can have, you like I met Jesus, but, and have this completely different experience. So it just seems almost silly in a sense to have something that can be so vague and so different depending on different people as like the foundation for something that's supposed to kind of rule us all, if that makes sense. Well, and I think, you know, like with any text, you know, the Bible has been interpreted by people over the centuries, often by men. And Mm -hmm. do you think about its original form? We don't know what that was. We don't know. We don't have original text. We can't see Mm -hmm. how it was translated and altered over the centuries, which you know it has to have been. Oh, yeah. And, you know, so everyone who comes to a document like that, you know, 
whatever form that may be, the Quran, the Bible, or what have you, they are going to have their own experience with it because they are their own person. Yeah. And there are certain unifying principles that some people will just say, okay, great, I'm just going to buy into this. And other people say, well, I accept sort of the basic tenets. But mm -hmm. my experience leads me to believe this is a better interpretation. They can be fine with that. And then some people just say, you know what? I just can't accept any of this because it doesn't mm -hmm. make sense for me. So mm -hmm. I think those are all valid. The problem, of course, is when one perspective is saying, well, everyone has to believe the same way as I do. It's like, no, mm -hmm. everyone needs to be able to believe, you know, the way that is right for them. So long as they are not harming other people with that belief. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's where we keep coming down to people saying, well, I believe this, therefore I should be able to legislate you. It's like, no, that's not correct. I yeah. don't believe that. And you don't have the right to do that just because you are reading one interpretation of your religious text. You know, I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's absolutely wrong. So yeah, what we have a thing in this country law. where, <laughs> yeah, but we have a thing in this country where we are built on this, you know, we have very strong religious roots in the United States. And mm -hmm. that shows often in the way that people approach laws and approach governing. I mean, the separation of church and state is something that people have been fighting to remove for a long time mm -hmm. because they would, they would feel more comfortable that way. But we absolutely cannot let that happen for many reasons, including the fact that they would then, some people would then use that to enforce their morals on other people. Mm -hmm. so. I wonder, because I feel as if our nation has a lot of just like a cultish kind of pagan influences, like on the surface, yeah, it's very, you know, Christian Jesus, but um, you know, our money has all of these occult symbols and kind of if you study different politicians, you start to find out some kind of interesting kind of pagan things going on that makes me, I just had this thought come into my head, just kind of feel as if there's an allegiance to whatever force kind of founded America. This is starting to sound like a conspiracy, but I think it's a good one that I'm coming up with. That <laughs> There is kind of like a reason as to why people are so like, we can't separate church versus state. And I totally get what you're saying too. But because I like just mentioned Hecate, I do feel as if when for instance, my deck that I made, I feel like it was kind of heavily influenced by my relationship with my guides and goddesses, etc. So I'm not going to like three years down the road be like, oh, this deck has nothing to do with Hecate. So I kind of feel like America, in a sense, had such like a spiritual, in a sense, foundation, and that's led to its success and there's like a very strong, possibly spiritual force that's like, you will not betray me. That could be underlying, could be a conspiracy that I just made up, but right now it's starting to make sense to me. So. Well, I mean, there's obviously Freemason symbols all over the place, you know, because yeah. that's a very powerful organization that still exists. And I mean, so there are, I think that's a valid point. I don't think there's a, I mean, unless you count a, unequal distribution of wealth, a global conspiracy, which it certainly could be. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there are certain principles that were handed down that became enshrined in, you know, documents. And, you know, the interpretation is certainly no longer as relevant as it was. But at the time, things were written either to satisfy certain parties and make sure they'd sign said document, or they were yeah. supposed to be, well, that's a bribery going on here, <laughs> or they were supposed to be overarching enough that they would be relevant years and you know years and centuries in the future but the problem is now of course that people don't want to interpret the document in a certain way there are certain things they don't want to amend any further because it would lead to either them losing certain liberties they feel yeah. or it just they figure that if you alter the document enough perhaps it makes it invalid and it loses its power which is, <laughs> is not the case it needs to be updated to ref better reflect the times Mm -hmm. But then you have, you know, obviously a, a group of powerful people who are putting other powerful people in office because they believe things, and that's not the way it's supposed to work. You're supposed to have a group of people who interpret, quote-unquote, sacred documents or governmental documents that are impartial or as impartial as they can be because then you are serving more people. If you have people who mm -hmm. are politically motivated, they're going to be serving an agenda, and then the document's going to be interpreted in a certain way. The power is going to move in a certain direction. You're going to end up with inequality, which is what we have now. So it's just, yeah, it's, 
it's a trend, you know, and it swings. It's like a, it's a pendulum. Yeah, it swings pendulum. back and forth. <laughs> and, we, and we are going in one direction right now. And it's really a frightening direction. So it's just a matter of, you know, can the power be more equally distributed? Which is, that's when countries run better is when the power is not wholly subsumed in one group who has a certain agenda that is so clearly against what the majority of the people in a country may want. Hmm. I really don't know. As I said, I don't watch the news, so I'm not the best to comment on this. But I have been feeling lately, like, whenever, because I don't watch the news, and I'm pretty much a person who's very neutral, when I do watch it, I just feel as if it's, to be honest, just like a portal to a timeline that I'm like, mm, that's not my timeline. And then I just turn it off, or I'm just like, over it and then I just go about my day and create and manifest a timeline that really I notice when I talk to people who like not you but like people at work who are like entrenched in the news I feel like we are just completely different people so why do I say this I'm totally like forgetting what my point was oh because I feel as if there are various timelines that we as, I don't know if you identify as a witch, but as people who identify as witches can access. And so I want to know your opinion on, let's say you do believe that there are different timelines that we can access via magic. We're creating our reality. If that's the case, what's the big deal about inequality, laws, justice, Trump, etc. Well, I think for one thing, even if you can access another timeline, people still have to live in this one. And so Mm -hmm. I think that it would be irresponsible and cruel to say, well, I can make my own timeline. I can make for my own destiny, as it were. Mm -hmm. And rather than just saying, well, I'm fine. You know, that's just sticking your head in the ground in a sense. And you may, you know, you may make your own path. That may be fine. But there are plenty, you know, but that is not negating the effects of what's going on here. And I do follow the news. I am, I mean, I made this comic. I'm obviously very politically (laughs) active. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I am that person who knows what's going on, who knows all the headlines and is calling her senators, if not daily, then quite often I have them on Mm -hmm. speed dial. So, you know, even if I can, even I have the ability to do something like that, say, okay, well, I can open a door to another world and I can step through and I'm fine. That's an answer, but it is not the right answer because what about the people you leave behind? And so I think that just saying, well, witches can create their own timelines, that's great. Mm -hmm. But this timeline has people here who deserve the same consideration, who should have the tools to better their own timeline. Very interesting. Yeah, okay. So I was listening to that perspective because I was thinking like, That's interesting. Probably because I really, I know that I'm like in another world. So a lot of this is just kind of like either going under or over or just like on my side where I'm just like, I don't really care. But it is, that is interesting. Um, Oh, I did want to say that when I was more so involved in politics, like I worked in New York and so a different lobbying firm and then city council and assembly I did not know how easy, and this is even before I identified with like magic or anything, but it's crazy easy to make changes in your local area. And even where I live now, like I literally just called my mayor and was like, this is when I was more involved with music. I was like, I'm a musician and I just moved into town. And like, he set me up with stuff. And when I was at the... um, city council it was like you just get random people that come in with a complaint and then a couple days later it's addressed or like fixed so I think for people who don't call and are like call my senator like that sounds like a lot of work or nothing's gonna change I'm just like here to say and I'm sure you know I mean I don't know what you're calling for but it's literally so easy in from my experience (laughs) to get your voice heard to a degree and to make small changes it's not like some grandiose thing where you need a million dollars to start making change 
Well, I think that one thing is that some people may have phone anxiety, which I think is perfectly understandable. Mm. Yeah. And so one thing to do is to call after business hours and get their voicemail. And then you can record your message. You can erase your message and Mm re-record it. So you don't have that feeling like you're on the spot. I mean, I usually Mm -hmm. make a note or two and say, here's what I'm calling to tell the staffers about. And they are always really nice. Some of them recognize my voice. I've called enough. (laughs) And they may say, oh, you're calling again this week. Hello. (laughs) It's like, yes, yes, I am. But I think that if you don't want to talk to a person, you can certainly call and leave a voicemail. If that's you know, if you need to call your Congress people, you don't have to do it during business hours if that scares the heck out of you, which is mm-hmm. valid. Um, but I call during <laughs> business hours because I like to express myself. I'm always very polite, of course, but I do mm-hmm. like to be passionate about, you know, my feelings. I mean, I have Democratic mm-hmm. senators. I'm very lucky in that. And they mm-hmm. are fierce and they are out there, you know, doing their jobs, which is wonderful. But mm-hmm. it's still good to reinforce your feelings, to let them know that the constituents do care. Even if you have Democratic senators, you should call mm-hmm. them and let them know, you know, thank them. Say, hey, thanks for standing up on that issue. Or I really feel you need to step up more on that issue. And I'm mm-hmm. watching, you know, what's going on. And I would mm-hmm. like you to do more. So yeah. even if your senators are, for the most part, you know, doing what you want, you know, and helping people and all that. It's just good to give them that feedback. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we pay them. So yeah, we, I feel like thing. we, we are paying their afraid. salaries. So <laughs> they are working for us. So it's okay to give, think of it as feedback. You're giving someone who works for you feedback, exactly. you know, and that is, you know, if people think, well, I don't have the right to do that. No, you absolutely do. You voted yeah. them into the office. They are serving with your blessing, as it were. Mm-hmm, and if they are not mm-hmm. serving the way that the people want, then someone else needs to be elected to do so. Yeah. Yeah, and there is a definite magic here as well in just letting your voice be heard. And I think it's so simple that people don't think of it as this magical thing. But, I mean, being politically active or not politically active is quite magical. Making that call, voting, is to some people. It is believing that you can get into that timeline that you want. You can make that reality that you want with that call or whatever. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Calling, leaving a voicemail. I think it's just important for us to know that we can make change in our world. It doesn't have to be lighting a candle, hexing anybody, or drawing sigils. It can be as simple as, like you said, leaving a voicemail, deleting it, and then doing it over. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, and that's certainly, I mean, if you're really upset about something, you may have to because you're just spluttering. You're so furious, you're spluttering. So it's always nice to be able to say, no, I would prefer to re-record that message and sound (laughs) like a reasonable human being so they'll take me seriously, you know? Mm -hmm. What are some modern day issues that you think that most witches, and it doesn't matter how you identify as a witch, like garden witch or Wiccan witch, southern witch, what issues do you think witches should have kind of in the forefront do you feel are issues of importance to people who identify as pagans? Well, I think that witch issues are human issues, which is kind of a takeoff of, you know, other things we say, but Mm -hmm. I think that witches obviously are concerned about the environment, we're concerned about the effect people have on it. So I think that obviously climate change, I mean, that's a huge one, you know, Mm -hmm. because witches are very aware of and tied into nature. You know, exactly. wh- whatever element you choose to associate with, if you associate with elements chiefly instead of, you know, perhaps uh, sort of a Gaia philosophy. Mm-hmm. So I think chiefly that and, you know, human rights. Mm-hmm. I mean, humans are part of nature, you know, although sometimes mm-hmm. they're destroying it. Uh, so I think those issues are really important. I just think being involved, you know, as much as you can, I think that be you a witch or be you someone who's not a witch, then you need to pick an interaction that's going to be beneficial. You feel like you're making a difference, but not something that's going to burn you out. Because if it burns you out, you can't help. 
you know, you need to yeah. you need to not maybe don't make twelve hundred calls to your senators in a week. <laughs> you know, do one a day. You know, is it do you have a monthly donation to the ACLU or to Planned Parenthood? And you know that those things are every month. You're doing those little things, and then perhaps you make calls to your senators and you distribute information. I mean, so you pick the way that you can support the will of nature, you know, in a positive bent. And you do mm-hmm. that, but you do not do so much that you completely wipe yourself out because, and you're sick, you're tired, and you're not being able to help anybody else. Yeah. Don't burn your own self at the stake, witches. And um, what do you think about witches who kind of come out and say that they're kind of using their craft against, I think I saw something recently about uh, a group that was doing some spells against the NRA. Obviously we know about people saying that they were hexing the president. What do you think about that coming out as hexing political figures, doing kind of ritualistic magic against political groups? Well, I think it's a really fraught topic among witches because Mm -hmm. you have things like the rule of three. You have the idea of karma, obviously, whatever Mm -hmm. you put in the world comes back to you. And I think there is something to that. So I think that you have to really weigh, is it worth it? You know, is it worth it to put that intent out into the world? You know, what yeah. are the consequences, consequences going to be? I mean, I remember when I was learning about witchcraft, when I was really little, and the rule of fate was huge. You know, everybody was just talking about, okay, if you do this, mm-hmm. you might become a toad, or you're going to have something <laughs> bad happen to you later, you know? So, I mean, it was just, hmm, do I really want to do that? And it's, it's sort of tied in the golden rule. I mean, would you want that horrible thing to happen to you? Probably not. So how can yeah. you act in such a way that is not perhaps, you know, trying to do something utterly horrible to someone? I mean, is, are there subtle ways to <laughs> affect things? Are there yeah. you know, perhaps doing more positive rituals in, in general and saying, exactly. okay, maybe changing this person's mind in a good way would mm-hmm. that help, you know, instead mm-hmm. of saying, let's put more negativity on them. And one way to think of it is perhaps that maybe these people just won't be affected as much by that because they're so negative already, you know, and that Mm -hmm. may not be true. I mean, there's some (laughs) rituals that will be effective and some that just won't be. But think about it. If someone is like Hexus from Burn Gully, you know, it's like they're just, yeah, yeah. I mean, that that guy, he just ate it up, you know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, so you have to think about, you know, what is the result going to be? of that. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I just look at some of these guys, you know, these horrible people, and it's just like, what is wrong with you? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and do you even notice? You know, are they mm-hmm. so far gone in their ideology that they don't realize what's going on, or do they not care? Mm-hmm. So something like that might not even, that would just roll off some of them. Mm-hmm. So I think it's something that has to be really carefully weighed. You yeah. Know, and and the ultimate intent, you know, have to know exactly what you're doing, why you're doing it, and If there are going to be consequences, who's going to be shouldering them? Are they going to come back on you or are they going to come back on people, you know, perhaps a more vulnerable population who can't protect themselves, Mm -hmm. who doesn't know how to do that? Yeah. I think what magic really taught me in a kind of subconscious and discreet kind of way is that um, there is this sort of neutrality. So I think a lot of people, when they're starting out, they can probably be like, well, if I want this, I'm going to need to either hex this person or banish them. And there's no sort of like maybe even realizing that there's other possibilities that you can manifest that's blessing both of you. And I also think that some people just only believe like like you said with the pendulum, like they're so far to either the right or the left that they don't understand that they're pretty much the same as their so-called opposites. So I do feel that magic, the practice of it, when it comes to kind of politics, and I'm talking like real magic, being in that kind of meditative state and you're feeling the energies, kind of allows you to see kind of political activities in a different light than maybe you would when you're just so just like I'm so passionate and angry I don't partake in any sort of like political magic but when I do do magic I do feel myself just seeing something because I have to kind of elevate myself to do magic to certain kind of things that I just see it in a 
completely different light. I wanted to share that. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, you have to think about if, if you're casting that kind of spell, will it drag you down to their level, too? That's another consideration, I think. I mean, there's certainly instances where you have to say, is this spell worth it? I mean, is this yeah. what we have to do, you know? But there are times you have to say, okay, am I just so angry? I just want to hex the hell out of this guy. Yeah, exactly. And, but is that going to drag me down to his level? In which case, then you have to spend all that time pulling yourself back up and, you know, cleaning yourself off of all that mm -hmm. stench. So it's like, well, is that really worth it? You know? Exactly. You know, go have a bath. <laughs> you know, go exactly. read a good book. Burn some sage. Do, you know, whatever your chosen method of cooling off and then figure out what you need to do rather exactly. than just, you know, acting angry. Exactly. And I will say what I did like about all of this is I feel that people are finally coming to maybe even purging and losing that sort of some people are purging and losing that idea that someone is going to control your whole life. Like a man is going to control your whole life and there's nothing you can do about it. Like I feel that you had kind of alluded to how empowered you kind of became once you saw that and then you started to become even more like my voice matters I don't care what's going on I'm making a change and I'm doing all that I can so I kind of feel as if people are again to touch on what we had said before that people are becoming really empowered and kind of finding their own magic within themselves and are saying you know what I'm kind of taking my life back. I'm not going to be feeling comfortable and going to sleep because I'm comfortable with the Obamas. You know, I feel like I could even say I, that I feel that some people are kind of watching the news more so than they did when Obama was the president. When, when Obama, you get what I'm trying to say. <laughs> because no, no, there's I not this do. degree no, of I comfortability. Because, no, I, th I agree. Because I think that people are, have become out of necessity more politically aware. Because yeah. we know that, I think some people thought that you could basically just trust the government to do the right thing most of the time. And you called your senators occasionally, yelled, and things worked out. It's like, no, you can't. And, mm -hmm. you know, these things take engagement of people. They take engagement of a lot of people. And yeah. so it's interesting to watch that, you know, it's like, you know who all the senators are. You know what all the legislation is. And I've been in a position where I'm talking to baby boomers. They say, so what's going on today? I'm like, well, let me tell you the top three headlines. They're looking at me. It's like, this affects me. You're a baby boomer. Your time on this earth is a little shorter. You know, got your own priorities. But here's what I'm left with, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I'm aware of all these issues. Mm -hmm. And so I think the political engagement aspect of it is great. I think the way we've come to it is horrible. Because we're actively, you know, anyone who's not a straight white dude in this country is basically freaking out unless they're, you know, kind of I'm not falling freaking out, guys. Just wanted to let my listeners know. Yeah. <laughs> Go on. Well, I, yeah. So I think that... Um, we have a population who is very comfortable because they know they're not going to be harmed. You have people who are mm -hmm. pretty secure and say, okay, well, this is where I am and this is what's going on. But you have a lot of people who are justifiably really concerned because mm -hmm. either historical trends or because of ongoing prejudice is just becoming worse, you know, under, mm -hmm. you know, these people. It's like, Man, there were, America's always had racial problems. <laughs> yeah, this is why this conversation, I feel I'm just like, I'm literally, while you're talking, I'm asking myself, why do I not care as much as she cares? And I think you kind of, <laughs> when you mention the racial thing, I think for some of us, it's kind of like, not maybe so entrenched, but I think it's like a combination of two things. Like, if you aren't, like you said, like a straight white male, I think you said, you kind of have it in your mind that your life is not going to be easy. Life isn't fair. So when things that appear to not be fair or whatever pop up, you're not like shocked by it. And I think also because I strongly identify with being a witch, I also am just like, maybe it's not my priority thinking about it. When I was in school, I was like heavily into politics and then I just kind of stopped caring, which I think tied in with my own burgeoning spirituality. So I wanted to kind of not interrupt you, but I was just like really thinking about it, like what's going on with me? So for listeners, maybe you identify with me and we're like, why do I not care? 
maybe you identify with what I said. Maybe you really do care. And so email me. Let me know your thoughts on it. So sorry to interrupt you, but had to get that out. Well, no, I, th I think that's all you know, very true. I think that, but we have things going on right now where, for instance, today, just today, the House Appropriations Committee passed mm -hmm. an amendment that makes it possible for uh, adoption agencies that are funded by taxpayers to deny LGBT families mm -hmm. the ability mm -hmm. to adopt a child based on religion. So that is huge. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that I think a lot of LGBTQ people have been f afraid of is that with this um, very, I would also, I'm going to say narrowly religious because they are religious about certain things, um, mm -hmm. you know, other things they don't seem to care about. Yeah. Group is, is taking, uh, is in power and is using this particular environment to enact their agenda. And so that's making mm -hmm. it difficult to, you know, live your life the way you want it to, to go about business just to be protected. So things like this are mm -hmm. obviously on people's minds and are very frightening. Hmm. For some reason, I thought that this already was the case, right? There, Wasn't it in some states that if you weren't in the man-woman relationship, you couldn't adopt? I feel like I'm not making this up. This is this is the House <laughs> Appropriations Committee, though. It's oh, okay. okay yeah. So that's it's weird. yeah. It's I mean, states have always had you know the ability to do certain things, and then you know everyone has to fight against you know, mm -hmm. crappy mm -hmm. things that the states are doing. But you know when the federal government is doing this, then it becomes an entirely different matter. Then it's exactly. becoming, right, and that's what people are really afraid of is, okay, this state may have a terrible bathroom law, but people are fighting against it, you mm -hmm. know, and, and the country doesn't agree, but when the federal government says, well, you know, guess what? Gay people can't get married anymore. Gay mm -hmm. people can't adopt kids. Yeah. And it's like, that's huge steps back, and that's what people are afraid of. Yeah. There is so much going on in this world, guys. And just from hearing me, you may have thought that some spiritual people have no opinion nor perspective, but this segment is here to prove that witches and energy workers aren't always above the drama and aren't indifferent or nonchalant about current events. So in this segment of Pagan Perspectives, we talk about the hot and juicy topics that affect all of us, witches included. So in this episode, Kirsten and I will be sharing our opinion on dun -da -da -dun, Facebook, tagging people in photos, having algorithms push certain agendas forward, political agendas, I might add, the misuse of personal privacy, how Facebook represents the dark corners of society, and more. So, Kirsten, what do you think about Facebook and what well. it represents to modern day witches? So, loaded question, being that I have done a lot of work in social media. So I have had to use Facebook on numerous occasions and still do for clients. So Facebook is useful in a lot of ways. Yes. It allows you to see pictures of your grandparents and your cousins and that person you <laughs> didn't know you cared about from high school. Um, <laughs> but it's also obviously being used by corporations and even foreign governments to push foreign agendas. And I think that's wrong. I think that the fact that Facebook has allowed this to happen and has profited off it is horrible. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we have people in leadership positions of such companies where they're saying, well, you know, we're going to prize free speech. It's like, well, you need to interpret that in a different, you know, how you're interpreting free speech is mm -hmm. we're going to promote the speech of certain people who pay us more, which is, yeah. not, is not right. That's not free speech? Oh, no, okay. and, you know, especially when you're... Okay. <laughs> promoting damaging things. You're using <laughs> algorithms to promote certain things into people's feeds. And I know that I curate my feed fiercely and I make mm -hmm. sure I'm not seeing certain things. I will unfriend you, you know, if you are promoting um, Trump or conservative politics. So I don't have that in my feed. But mm -hmm. people are so easily influenced by Facebook and other sites like that. Some people just, they see, if they see something in text, they assume it's fact. So mm -hmm. having uh, measures in place where it can be noted that this is unverified or the source is very visible saying, this person says this, oh, but here's another perspective. You know, if you're going to promote mm -hmm. something that's wildly on one side, then you have to present something that's on the other side and present them together instead of just mm -hmm. giving people a stream of... That's a lot to read. <laughs> well, you can... Headlines. Headlines are good. And having written lots of headlines, you can condense stuff down. I mean, it, it can be done. But yes. 
it clearly wasn't a priority. <laughs> and, you know, things like tagging people. I don't like being tagged in photos. I don't put that stuff on my feed. You know, my feed mm -hmm. is very curated. You know, I put certain mm -hmm. things up. And I don't put, you know, tag photos. I mean, I'm like, I don't I tell my friends, don't tag me in photos. I'm not going to put it yeah. up. I don't want to be tagged. Um, exactly. I don't put a lot of photos of me online in general, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I think is fine. You know, if you want to put selfies online, that's great. You know, that's, that's for you. I don't like to do that. But I think that it's really useful, obviously, for finding out stuff about the world. But it's also mm -hmm. being misused. You know, your personal mm -hmm. data is not secure. Uh, I think that a lot of times people just say, oh, just log in and say I have a password and everything's great. And they don't bother mm -hmm. to read how their data is being used. You need to read the yeah. user term, terms and conditions. You yeah. need to read those updates. You need mm -hmm. to ask them you know, the questions. Don't blithely assume that your permissions are set the way you want to. Go in and do those checks. Mm -hmm. I think that that's really important because I'll get those notifications from Facebook. And I'll go and double check that X new feature is not sharing my information all over the internet. You know, it's like you don't need to know that. You know, you have the yeah. bare minimum for me, and that's all you get. You know, if you yeah. have any more, it's because you're my friend. You're on that inner level, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that those are all things that every social media company needs to address. And some are doing it better mm -hmm. than others, clearly. Um, some are being fined, <laughs> like Facebook is, yeah. you know, facing scrutiny and fines because of their uh, failure to act in ways that they should. So mm -hmm. it will be, remains to be seen how this changes, you know, Twitter's purging, you know, bot accounts, which I think is a great first step. They need to purge Nazi accounts. So it just... Well, would, wouldn't that be against freedom of speech or that's hate inciting Nazi accounts? Or it's uh, like a private thing so they can ban whoever they want. Wait, Twitter's public, right? <laughs> it, it is. So yeah. my thing okay. is, okay, Nazis, if you're ascribing to a Nazi philosophy, you're ascribing to a philosophy that believes in genocide, that believes in killing people to have a pure race, quote unquote. Yeah. And I don't think that needs to be anywhere. You know, you can go in a dark mm -hmm. corner and talk with your friends about that, but I don't need to see that. And these people attack other people. It is, you know, not something where there's, oh, they're just living their lives. No, they're not just living their lives. They mm -hmm. are, in, they are hateful and they're inciting hatred in others. So they don't have a place on these platforms. That, mm. that's, you know, if I, I have worked in community moderation, I've seen these people, I've seen the policy where you let them be. Mm. And they always, always, always can't just hang out. They have yeah. to go after people. They have to attack people. It's like, no, you don't allow their behavior. You ban them. You say, okay, you can't do that. We don't allow this kind of hate speech. We don't allow this kind of philosophy because it is hateful. Mm -hmm. So, but clearly, I'm not running Twitter, so. <laughs> I saw something. Um, I was just watching YouTube, some video about Selena. God, the tennis player, Selena. Um, her husband, and, like, in the comments, you know, that's, like, the holy grail on the internet. And people are like, well, why didn't Jimmy Fallon ask him about, because um, her husband is, like, the founder, co-founder of Reddit, and they were like, oh, well, Reddit allows for hate speech. And why didn't they talk about that? And it was like all these comments about like nothing to do with why he was on the show, but like talking about social media. So I think that there is kind of this push for that people are like, OK, as a social media platform, you have a responsibility to the people to to make this safe space, which I think is interesting. I was on this um was it Pathios? I forgot the name of this app, but it's a very witchy app. And they're like so tight on like everything that you write. Like if it's a forum for like witches who drink tea, if you write one post that's like, I had a soda, they like block your account. They're like, we're sorry. You went against the rules. This is a peaceful environment. So I am aware that there are some social media platforms that do promote a safe space and they're not even having advertising. They're at their grassroots, you know, they're really a place for like witches, like just how Facebook used to be, I guess, at the beginning. I mean, I don't know really what the goals were. Well, if you think about Facebook's origins, you know, if you build an app to rate women, that's really not the greatest foundation in and of itself, the intent behind that. We have built an app to rate people on their attractiveness. So that's mm. not great. Unless you get a 10, ladies. Just kidding. <laughs> I, I, I honestly, it's like I have 
something I don't care about. <laughs> uh, you know, but I think that, you know, on the other side, we were talking about this app who's banning people when they perhaps post about tea or coffee. Mm-hmm, which shouldn't mm-hmm. have. I think that, you know, everyone should get a warning. You know, say, yeah. you posted about tea, this is a coffee forum. And people mm-hmm. say, oh, crap, I won't do that again. And then they post again mm-hmm. and you say, all right, we warned you. And the policy yeah. is you're banned after one warning. That is mm-hmm. reasonable. You know, if someone comes mm-hmm. along the platform and starts spewing Nazi hatred, say, well, guess what? We don't allow that. You've got a warning. They say, and they start spewing again. You say, all right, you're gone. That would be mm-hmm. a way to do it. And then people would get the idea that this is a platform that doesn't allow that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you think that social media platforms are a good place for witchy people to be on? Well, I think that they're invaluable just to connect because I know a lot mm-hmm. of my friends live, you know, around the country and a lot around the world. It's like we wouldn't have met if not for social media mm-hmm. platforms. Mm-hmm. I think that it's up to you to, because if a platform is not going to help you protect yourself, you have to figure out, you know, block lists and other measures of protecting yourself. So mm-hmm. I think it is, it behooves you to curate your social media experience to what works for you. And if that means blocking every idiot who replies to your friend's tweet, <laughs> I think that's perfectly fine. <laughs> you know, you don't owe anyone an explanation for why they're being blocked. I'm sure there's people who blocked me because they're like, well, I didn't like that she tweeted about cats 500 times, you know, that day <laughs> or something. I'm like, well, I'm sorry, but that's your right, you know. Yeah. And, but, you know, these people who are, you know, pissed off because, you know, so-and-so blocked them. It's like, no, your social media feed is basically your house. And I don't yeah. have to let anyone in my house I don't like. And if exactly. I ask you to leave and you don't leave, then I'm going to kick you out of the house. Yeah. Which is an analogy that I don't think a lot of people get. They just see the internet as being public, which it is, Mm -hmm. but you're Mm -hmm. there, you're there by their invitation. So you should be polite in their mentions. That is their space. That's not your space. Your feed is where you get to talk about your stuff. So long as it follows the guidelines of the platform you're on. Exactly. I love that you mentioned that because your feed can be your sacred space. And you can invite negative energies into your space unknowingly if you don't curate like you were just saying. I think it's really important to curate and kind of keep abreast, if you're on social media a lot, kind of keep abreast of the changes with the algorithms that Instagram's doing, Facebook is doing, so that you kind of maintain that sacred space. Yeah, I I definitely agree. So I, I am really careful about who I follow, you know, it's like if, you know, they're not, you know, because you get followed often by accounts with big numbers, you know, and you look at this mm-hmm. person and they're obviously just following you for Bought their numbers. Them. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, I think it's, it's okay to just check them out and say, okay, well, this person's followed by five of my friends and they mm-hmm. seem okay instead of just auto following people because then you end up with, you can end up with trouble or you can end up with a nice person. So it's like, just, just check, just double check. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, it's easy exactly. and then you don't have to deal with them later. Exactly. And, and the other thing is like mute words. If there are words that you don't want to see or topics you don't want to see, mute them. So there are some tools available that are helpful. Mm-hmm. I think that there can be a lot more. And mm-hmm. I don't know if some platforms want to charge for certain tools, certain extra, extra tools, but something obviously needs to be done to clean up a lot of these platforms. Speaking of platforms, where can people find you on their preferred platforms? Well, I am primarily on Twitter. I am on Instagram a little bit, but it's like, it's mostly my cats <laughs> and, you know, various cooking food things. And, you know, if I'm wandering around and, oh, look, there's a picture of the ocean. Because um, I live in an absurdly beautiful, I live in the Pacific Northwest, which is absurdly mm-hmm. beautiful, even if it's also absurdly hot and humid right now. So I'm melting mm-hmm. in my office as we speak because I have Aww. my fan off for this interview because I care Aww. about your... Yes, I care about your interview experience. Um, so, yes, you can find me on Twitter at Kat, and that's K-A-T-A-N-N Thompson, T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. And, again, lots of politics yelling, pictures of my cats, <laughs> lots of pictures of my cats, um, you know, talking about writing and other things. But, yes, that's where I am the most active. Awesome. So, witchy Trump supporters, just forget what she just said. Do not follow her. You will be blocked. And (laughs) to everyone else who really just wants something that's real, witchy, fun, cute, go on Kickstarter now. If you're listening to this a bit later, hit this girl up on Twitter. Find out how to get series one, two, three, four, and beyond. 
of the I Am Hexed series. Everything about this series, where you can find it now, will be in the description. And guys, just remember that you do have a voice, be it witchy, political, or not, and you can make a change in your world. Thanks, guys. This has been an episode of Magic and Mediums, the podcast to learn magic. Make sure to subscribe, write a review on iTunes, and share.